My name is David. Uh, I'm a developer and Scrum Master at WooCommerce. Uh, been with the company for around four and a half years now. And I'm going to talk to you today about the new face of WooCommerce. And I am very purposefully omitting the words or the acronyms of just saying UI because there's a lot more that goes into it than just that. Um, the topic here is going to be not as much a UGS tutorial or uh, a tutorial in any of the technologies that we use, because I'm assuming that's not why you're here and it's not as relevant. What I'm aiming for instead is to take you through some experiences that we've had through the long and winding journey to reaching, well, where we are right now, uh, to paint up a picture of all the decisions that we've taken throughout the years, and some of the takeaways and lessons that we've learned uh, sort of throughout uh, the long path of this project and actually multiple projects. I will take you, take you to a trip to time. So we're going to talk about our plans, how we set them into motion, what lessons we've learned, what decisions we've made, and what experiences, good or bad, we've gone through. So, the year is 2017, and this is about the inception of Project Lux. Bitcoin prices in 2017 are skyrocketing. <laughs> net, net neutrality is in danger for the very first time. And the first self-driving car is the road in the United States. But in a small city in Denmark, Aarhus, <laughs> in the newcomer's lab, something starts cooking. And we call it Project Lux. Still 2017, this project is set out to become the new UI of newcomers. It is decided that it will be built on the popular framework <coughs> called Angular, a uh, JavaScript framework. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And a team of one to three developers, I'll always talk in ranges because these things fluctuate across the period of a year, are set out uh, to undergo this task. What was the idea behind it? The idea is to leverage uh, the framework Angular and the technology called OData to essentially create a framework of user interfaces that's based on data served from the server will be able to just almost, and I put it in quotation, automate the generation of user interface. So you get a bunch of data from a server, and the framework will know exactly how to render a view for this. A brilliant idea. Um, and a, another decision is taken at this point, which is that it will be developed separately from the core platform with the plan to be reconnected with it at a later date in time. So time is moving on. The year is now 2018, and we're going close to project to talking about Project Condo. Microsoft releases its first Linux product in 2018, which was a wow for everyone. Bitcoin now crashes by 75%, <laughs> and the EU implements GDPR. A wonderful year for everyone. At the newcomer's office, Project Lux is officially phased out and canceled. And I want to talk about why. The initial plan of building a framework on top of a framework that can do so many brilliant things at once was turns out to be too ambitious. The initial scope of the project was also too broad. It was essentially to replace the entire product information management part of e-commerce, just about what we're talking about today, but also to create this front-end framework mechanism. We started out building horizontally, almost exclusively horizontally, which meant that we built a lot of groundwork we built a lot of technology, but we never actually gotten around to building a vertical end-to-end uh, -end integration to 
see it, to see whether it is even feasible or not. And the theme, the theme says of one, two, three, a little understaffed perhaps for a complex product like this. So at the end of 2018, uh, a new project is set in motion, and it's codenamed Project Condo, and so I already touched upon why it's Project Condo, and hopefully it will spark joy. Um, and, but it's not a complete restart. It's not, we're not starting from scratch. We are taking experiences and things that we've learned from the previous project, and we're learning from them and moving forward with a new thing. Still 2018, a decision is made that this time it will be built on a framework called Vue.js, a framework that is rising in popularity. And I will talk about Vue a little bit later. A dedicated team of two to four developers is set out to carry this legacy forward about from project to project. I'll still mark it as a decision, and you'll see in a second. This time around, we build it straight into the core platform of e-commerce because we want to make sure that we know what we're doing, that we can do vertical slices, and that we can ship most importantly if we want to ship. We've learned the lesson. We don't do OData. We are building web services ourselves, and we are building them for the purpose. Now, OData is a brilliant tool <clears throat> but it turns out that the overhead of, well, implementing this with a complex product like e-commerce is not as easy as we thought. And also for performance considerations and uh, in general to fit our needs and architecture better, we decided that our web services need to cater specifically to our UI. At the end of 2018, WooCommerce 8 is released with the wonderful WooCommerce dashboard. Now, I know the reception for the dashboard wasn't <coughs> as amazing as we wanted it to be. Understandably so, but for us, it was an incredibly important piece for us to be able to move forward on this project because it was the very first production-ready vertical slice on this new technology stack that we had introduced. We proved to ourselves, essentially, we tested that we can actually start, in practice, replacing our UIs with the new stuff that we are actually building. So the year is now 2019, and Project Condo is still alive. <coughs> Samsung releases the first mainstream foldable phone this year. 5G service is just around the corner. It's a pretty good year. And Microsoft stores an entire movie on Skill Glass. It's Superman, by the way. Brilliant stuff. And we are going strong with Project Condo. And we have a plan. In 2019, the Kellogg's app ships as a beta, which is the very first time we are actually starting to replace a piece of the user interfaces with the new thing. The dashboard was something new, uh, and so self contained. This is working together with the rest of the system. But as the moment we ship something, which is great, we start getting feedback, and our eyes start to open at all the things that we are maybe missing, lacking still. We realize that we need to start collecting feedback, and we've talked about this before. At the, on the main stage with Jacob joining the team. We realize that we actually need to focus on interaction design and UI design because it turns out that developers left to their own devices are not amazing at creating UI with great user experience. Who knew? So new faces join newcomers. We have Jacob, who is our UI strategist. We actually have a UI designer as well. And this is a lesson we've learned the hard way, and it's been a long time coming. The team is thus increased to five to six people, and there are two more who are sadly couldn't be here today, um, joining us 
on the 1st of December. Uh, and this team of, at that time, 6th wave, will be working on this for the next long period of time. This is going to be the main focus of an entire development team. So, now we're at the team side that we can say comfortably that we'll make headway and we'll make progress. Furthermore, <clears throat> we also implemented a new workflow. Um, we are now taking into consideration design that we are now being handed, uh, that we iterate on together as the entire team. We've put in place a user acceptance flow to make sure that whatever, whenever we finish something, someone else has a look at it, someone from outside of the code base, to make sure that it is exactly what, what uh, people who use the platform will expect it to be. And we start collecting feedback. And the current status is that we are now on iteration three, maybe four, of the entire products and catalogs app that you have seen previously. And while we're not entirely done yet, we are now comfortable in the flow where we can uh, uh, move this project forward. So let's get a little more technical. And let me introduce you to the new tech stack on which we are building on. Again, it's not going to be a tutorial in any of these, but I will show off a few interesting bits. So we've picked Vue.js as our front-end uh, JavaScript framework. And I'm listing a few details about the framework itself on the left side of the screen. But this is actually something that surprised me when I was, uh, I was looking up some statistics. It actually says that between 2018 and 19, Vue.js surpassed um, Facebook's React as the most popular um, repository on GitHub based on the stars rate, with Angular slowly falling behind the other two in, in the competition. Now, the how favorite of a platform each of these is is not necessarily something that you should base your decision on. Uh, I just thought it interesting because I essentially looked this up yesterday and I had no idea before. So <clears throat> what Vue.js is, is a component model, a component framework, where you build a JavaScript component, and you put your views together based on that, which is very, very different from what we used to do before. Our current UIs are built in Blackboard. So um, I actually have a small demo, if I manage to properly switch over. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Awesome. So this is the products list. And currently, my product list down in the bottom is uh, empty because I'm currently on a catalog and catalog on a product. And what I'm actually going to demo today is not our UI, but rather a tool <coughs> that we use very often. This is a Chrome extension called uh, View Dev Tool. And, and it's, it's an amazing tool, and I recommend it very, very highly. And <clears throat> what I want to show today is actually uh, how we make the composition of our application with components. Team. So anyway, what, meanwhile this is going on, uh, what I was trying to, and hopefully be able to show up, <clears throat> is that is it to zoom in on a particular piece of, com of component, the main component which is the editor, because that is uh, supposedly uh, a familiar piece a familiar piece to everyone. So in the definition system, when you create a new definition field in your company, you will assign a data type to it. Uh, what I want to show is, as I mentioned, on the definition field, you actually select a data type that will be used to render your your custom field that you're adding to anything, your product, your category, your and so on. So back in the days in web forms, you would create, and uh, you can actually make your own as well in e-commerce. You would actually create a new web forms control that you will then register and tell e-commerce to render that field using that control. And surprisingly, it's very similar with you. So if I move this a little out of the way, 
and I'll go down to the specific thing that I want to show up right here. So <clears throat> what you see here is we have these components called a Boolean, a short text, a long text, a rich text, an image. These are the equivalents of the editor. When we hand uh, UJS a piece of newcomer's data, uh, UJS will automatically be able to figure out which one of these is the one, based on the editor that you configure inside newcomers, uh, which component to use this to render your property. So what we do is <clears throat> we can have a look at actual uh, data on this uh, component here in the database. And you'll see that we have something familiar. We have all the information in this component that is needed to, to be able to display and, for example, validate this field. In this case, we have the value. We have some, uh, some uh, validation rules. And we have the editor up here. And that's the, that's the magic keyword. So by handing this piece of data down to view, um, view will figure out, OK, this says short text. I'll find my short text component, and I'll display it on the screen. Now, this, com this makes these editors a little smart, smart in the sense that they do some logic, that they know how to figure out when to save a property, when should it trigger a save, when should it trigger some validation, how the field should but generally, when you're doing Vue.js, you are looking for stupid, dumb components as much as possible. You want to keep your logic at a higher level. So actually, each of the editors renders a thing that we call a form field. Um, these are essentially Vue.js components wrappers for HTML elements. Uh, sometimes a composition of HTML elements, sometimes something specialized. In this case, uh, for the short text, it renders an input. And if you have a look at all the data that's actually present, uh, the properties of the component, there is no more uh, mention of the definition. It's just flat out values, labels, and placeholders, things an HTML input form needs to know in order to render. So that is sort of the idea behind how we're architecting uh, on a very, very, very short, small scale. I'm going to try not to break anything and jump back into here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's in short about the, the front end framework. It's actually, um, I couldn't give you a tutorial on it because even when I'm full stack developer, my heart is still on the back end side. Um, but even for me, I actually i am growing to love this framework. So I would highly recommend giving it to Pretty brilliant. Moving on. Uh, the next thing I would like to talk about is actually the, the view apps. Uh, it's a shared state management library for view. So if you've worked with React before, it's, uh, it's inspired by Redux, which is <laughs> the same thing for a different way. And what it does is it makes the handling of data flow in complex uh, applications with many components easier at the cost of a little bit of boilerplate code. Um, in this case, uh, on the, on, here on the right-hand side, we have three components. And these three components could be in any particular hierarchical order. And if all three of them need to have access to the same piece of information, the, uh, uh, if not using the state management, it would, the data would have to trickle between the components by passing them down as properties and then meeting them back up as, as events. And that creates a lot of confusing code and a lot of uh, sort of spaghetti. Uh, Vuex helps alleviate this, and it leads to uh, long-term productivity at the cost of boilerplate. So the way Vuex works is <clears throat> it contains a state that cannot be changed unless you go through Vuex's preferred mechanism, which is a mutation. So what happens is component A needs to update the state. It will call an action. Actions are a middleman between the actual component call and the station in case you want to talk to a service or read something from the database, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Based on the results from there, it will call a mutation. And a mutation is essentially just a function that can 
actually has access to the state and can change it. After that, all, the, all three of these components can read from the state via a GAN. The GAN is just a function that knows what to pick up and how to serve it up. So instead of trickling data between components, we store it in a state somewhere, and it is, re it is ready to be used by many components at the same time. <clears throat> now, that's not the only benefit of using a uh, state management. State, the state down here can actually and should actually reflect the exact state of your UI at any given point. And that gives you awesome potential both for debugging and testing your components. I'm going to try to show off how. Right. Yes? Yes. I said that. So I'm here currently on my product list with my navigation component up on the top. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate the list. When I'm navigating, I am actually going up to the server, reading all the product information uh, back, populating the list. The list and what and how many products, which products, the product data that is currently displayed is in the state. So if I go to my view that tools again, and I hop on over to the View X tab. There's a lot of information here, let me explain. So the left-hand side is a timeline of mutations that have been committed to the state. It means that I can trace back exactly the state of my application with a second decision at any time. <clears throat> on the right-hand side, in the middle here, where it says state, I have the things that are saved in my state at that time. So right now I'm in the present, <clears throat> and I can see that my, my product has currently 75 columns uh, the list with 32 uh, currently loaded products into the list. I can at any point in time hop back to any of the previous mutations to see how the state looked at that time, and you'll see that by the inspected label. Down there. And I can go further back, and now I actually see I have zero rows. That's when I was covering the, the catalog instead of the catalog. Now, inspecting the state is already super useful, being able to see how it has changed over the time. But I can also do something more. Yes. So I've inspected the state when I was back on the catalog. I can actually time travel to the state. And by clicking that, I've taken back my UI to the exact point in time. So I can see whether uh, I can retrace all these tabs. Now this is useful, but it's, you don't need developer tools for this. You can actually do this programmatically. You can actually automate this and use it for testing as well, which is kind of cool. So that's about it for UX. I'm going to mention Web API. I, on the agenda for today, um, on the invitation, I said it is a new layer of e-commerce. Now, if you've worked with e-commerce before, you know that's not entirely true. We've used service tech before. We actually use Web API right now, so why is it new? Well, <clears throat> we have a new namespace for the new APIs. Big deal, right? We are making these new APIs in a very different design than the previous ones. We are striving to make them as REST-like <laughs> as possible, keeping it not RPC as much as possible. But we can go all the way there. Um, <clears throat> we are respecting the HTTP verbs, so the URLs will be readable. We are respecting entities as resources, so when you are querying variants, you'll be querying a product resource, but when you're uh, querying, for example, uh, products for a category, the resource is actually a category. Now, this is a decision we've made because even though we know it reduces the usability, uh, reusability of these APIs, it does give us something great and that is that we can actually control performance at a more granular scale. So, 
the last bit here is about a little study on a conceptual and experimental data model. I could not find more words to describe that it is not final. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it's actually working right now. Uh, in the product list and the product editor, this is what we use. So what do I mean by it? We want to separate the metadata part from the data part. Uh, this is actually a concept that already Project Lux was playing around with. And it, it was actually using it at a, at a very high level. What do we mean by metadata? Metadata is everything that comes from the definition system. The things that you set up in e-commerce where you go to settings, definitions, all the information stored there, like is this multilingual, should it be multilingual, is it required, all that is considered metadata. Why is it great that we're handling this separately? Well, one of the reasons is because we can query it once, keep it somewhere, for example, in the state, and not require it until it changes. And that is really cool because the definition system or the metadata of things changes way less frequently than the data does, which is why we can keep this. Currently, we're using the uh, if modified since HTTP added, which works out great. And then we just keep it there. It also means that we only have to query a product definition once, not once for every product that we actually query. The data, on the other hand, is the entity property value. It's the things that you fill out in your product editor in your commerce today. When you give a product a name, it is a property value. When you give one of your custom properties a value, it is a value. It is an entity property value. Um, what this, uh, and I'll have an example up in a second, but what is cool about it is the field, uh, the model itself, is insanely small. It's very, very simple. <laughs> Only two fields. And we can work on optimizing it uh, on very, very many levels. We can say, well, we want to look at everything. We can say we only need data that are not prices. Um, only only text properties and so on and if we need everything going down the line we can do things like uh, filtering and batching and that is it that is uh, taken from the actual product that is uh, currently uh, that term was showing up earlier on the left hand side we have the metadata uh, for one property exactly, which is called long description. It knows about the editor, how it should be, how this thing should be rendered. It has some validation rules. It has, it knows whether it's multilingual or not. <clears throat> the data part of this is actually, for, for demonstration purposes, actually put in three fields. Uh, there's a price, which is not, a, a not in the definition system, but we can use this model for it. It's a GUID, which will never be shown in the UI, but we can use this model for it. And the long description, which is actually, in this case, a definition field. And all of these have the exact same model. They have a GUID, an identity, <coughs> and the, the flat value itself. And just like the arrow shows, when we load these things, so this is already in the state, we load this from the API, we take the GUID, we look up its own little piece of content from the metadata. We take the two, marry them together, uh, which is essentially putting the value in there. It gets a little more complicated in case of enums and enum more dislikes, but this is the gist of it. And then, with that object that we then have, when the two are merged together, is actually the object I've shown you earlier, that the short text can actually know how to deal with. That was these two merged together. Um, so that object that we get from the merge, we hand over to Vue, and Vue will just know, OK, cool. It's a short text. I'll grab that component. It's a value. Cool, that's the value I'll put in. Uh, it should be validated in this and this way. Cool, I know how to do that. Um, and when it should be saved, on blur, on click, who knows? So data is simply the value. Metadata is everything around it. So 
that was essentially the example. I'm uh, very curious to see if there's any remarks on this or if there's any opinions about why this is a good idea. But the idea is to work with, hard to work with. And that will actually do it.